good to see you all back tonight. Glad that you are here. Uh, just remind you, briefly, ne- uh, two weeks, well, Friday night, not this coming Friday, but the following Friday at 7 o'clock, uh, we're going to have the Jason Lovins Band here leading us in worship. It's not just going to be a concert. It's going to be a worship concert. Uh, and I'm sure Jason will probably share his testimony, at least I hope that he does. And uh, they'll be here, but we're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs and chips at 6 o'clock. If you would care to come eat, we'll just have a collection basket out. You can donate uh, if you'd like to do that uh, to help cover some of the cost. But that is on Friday night, November the 4th. Next Sunday night, we're going to have a fifth Sunday night saying of our folks. And so I uh, look forward to that. And we're going to do finger food fellowship afterwards. So bring your favorite finger food. We'll have a fellowship after church next Sunday night after the sing. Uh, then on Sunday, December 4th, just so you'll, uh, I mentioned this morning, on Sunday, December 4th, that evening at 6 o'clock, a group by the name of Sacred, that goes by Sacred Harmony, they will be here doing a Christmas concert that night. And both of the concerts will be a love offering. So uh, help, I've got posters up here on the front. If uh, you know some place that you could put a poster up, uh, or if, if you need several, I've got uh, enough posters here. But if you can help spread the word, one of the ways, if you're on Facebook, go to the church website or church Facebook page and put that out. Jeremy, did you put that up on the church website? You did? So it's, it's there. But uh, you can share it from Facebook. If you'll just share it on your page, it'll go out and your friends will see it. Uh, do that, and, or if your friends with me on Facebook, you can go to mine, just look for the thing on the Jason Lovins Band concert. You'll see a picture that looks just like the poster and share that. I would appreciate it very much. Uh, that's all I know of and I'm aware of for, for announcements, other than if you want to help a, uh, a, uh, adopt a foster kid for Christmas, see uh, Brandy. She's got a list there of the, you won't get the child's name. Well, they, I don't think so, did he? You'll get the name, uh, and they need to collect that stuff by what December second, so that they can get that. Some of those she mentioned this morning. Some of these children are being uh, are in foster homes up in the Atlanta area. Some of them are actually having to stay in hotel rooms, and they have shifts that come in and watch them, and stay there with them. Can you imagine? I guess that's with the little ones, huh? So they're going to school during the day. I know, but I'm talking about the hotel rooms. All right. So imagine having to grow up like that. So if you, you know, partner up with somebody. You don't have, if you're, if you're able to take one and do it on your own, that's good. But if you're able, if you're not able, partner with somebody and say, hey, let's, let's do a, a kid. The uh, Backpacks of Appalachia, Y'all are about, when do, when do they go? Yeah, but when do they, when do? Okay, so that is coming up. So those are the things to be in prayer about. And uh, as, we, as we mentioned this morning, uh, be in prayer for uh, Robert Thomas's family. His father passed away Wednesday morning. So just keep that family in your prayers. Anything else? All right, it is good to be with you tonight. Let's open up with a word of prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Brother Ray and his team. Yeah, there they are. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come together for worship tonight, we lift up the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that we may proclaim uh, praises to you, for you indeed are worthy. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for this opportunity to worship together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody stand if you're able and sing, sing along. Be closer, drawn to thee. 
Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to Thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in Thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before Thy throne I stand. When I kneel in prayer and with Thee, my God, I commune as friends with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side.
side, living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. From all hearts sake, in a sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confide. He said he wanted to say just a brief word. Some of them thought he was going to sing. I heard Teresa and Steve back there, but he's got allergies today, so not going to sing today. I thought Steve thought she was going to sing. <laughs> All right, take your Bibles and look with me to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. I'm just going to read uh, verses 1 through 4 because we're going through the entire chapter and it kind of just goes like a rolling commentary, if you will. But there's some things I want to point out, so I'm uh, just going to read that. So if you would uh, stand, let's look at verses 1 through 4 of chapter 40. It came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker, the king of Egypt, offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in custody for a while. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You can be seated. Father, we uh, come before you tonight. We open up your word. We ask that you would speak to us through your word. And Father, as we see here tonight uh, how you have spoken in dreams, Lord, we can see in other occasions in Scripture where you've spoken in dreams. Lord, now we have your word. We have your completed revelation. And Lord, may we not just pursue after dreams, but Lord, may we pursue after you, a relationship with you. Father, guide us in this time tonight. Teach us, instruct us, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to tell you something. I want to point something out to you, because you'll see this phrase in different places in the Bible. You'll see it in uh, the New Testament, particularly in the book of Mark, one of the key words in the book of Mark is immediately. But you'll also see this phrase that verse 1 begins with. What does it say? And it came to, it came to pass. I like what Mark Lowry, Christian comedian, said, singer, about this verse, about it, it came to pass. He said, it didn't come to stay, it came to pass. Sometimes when you're in a storm, when you're in a, a tough situation, when you're in a tough way, just remember, it didn't come to stay, it came to pass. It doesn't stay with you. Now, we see in this 40th chapter, if you remember several weeks ago when we were looking, Joseph had been falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and Potiphar, she had accused him of attempting to rape her. Because if you remember, she had tried to seduce Joseph into having sex with her. And Joseph refused and would not give in. And then finally she caught him in the house one day by himself. She uh, approached him. He ran from her. and She grabbed his outer garment, his cloak, if you will, and had that. And when her husband came home, she said, this is the garment of that Hebrew slave that you gave me that, tried to, or that you brought into our house. And he tried to rape me. Potiphar then had Joseph imprisoned. He could, he, as captain of the guard, Potiphar could have had Joseph executed had he so desired. 
He did not, though. Why? Because God had a plan for Joseph's life. I just want us to be reminded as we look at the story of Joseph that God has a plan even when you don't understand it. That God has a purpose even when you don't see it. Because Joseph is right where he needed to be in order to carry out the purposes of God. He was in the exact place. He was not there and God said, oh, what am I going to do now? How am I going to work this out? How am I going to pull a, a Romans 8, 28 for Joseph? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. What can I do? What can I do? God never has a moment where he wonders what he can do. Nothing ever dawns on God. It, you know, as my pastor used to say, and somebody, I'm sure he heard somebody else say it, but it, when will it ever dawn on us that nothing ever dawned on God? God was not called off guard by Potiphar's wife accusing Joseph. He was not caught off guard when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery uh, and he ended up there. He was not caught off guard when Potiphar's wife accused him and now he's in prison. God was not surprised. And God was not having to come up with plan B. This is plan A all along. Now I want to remind you of something. You may find yourself in a tough situation. You may find yourself in a place that you don't want to be and you think, well, I'm here because of my own actions. Well, I would just remind you of what we call the story of the prodigal son. The father is always ready to receive you back. The question is not whether he will receive you back. The question is whether you will go back to the father. So if you're in a situation of your own doing, know that you've got to return to the father. But here in this case, Joseph has not done anything wrong. As a matter of fact, he's done what was right. And it cost him. And let me just remind you of this. Always do what is right, even if it costs you in the short term. Do what's right. It's never wrong to do right, as you've heard said. And Joseph is here, and he's in the prison. And why is he there? Because there's going to be this chief butler and this baker, that basically the, the, the taster, if you will, for Pharaoh and his baker, his steward that's going to be put into prison they're going to fall they fall out of favor with uh pharaoh and they're going to be thrown into prison and guess who's there in the prison joseph is and so when we ended chapter 39 we saw here it says here in verse 21 of chapter 39 but the lord was with joseph and showed him mercy and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison now that's very similar to what it said in verse 2 of chapter 39, when Joseph was sold and Potiphar bought him, that the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful, a successful man. You know, everything that he did, he, I don't want to say the Midas touch. The Midas touch is not a good thing. If you know the, the story of the Midas touch, everything King Midas touched turned to gold. Humans, items, objects, all these things turned to gold. It, it, it was a curse. It was not a blessing. So when you talk about, well, he has the Midas touch. No, that's not really, you go back and read the story. It's really not a, a blessing. It's a curse. But Joseph here was blessed because God was with him and because he was right where God wanted him to be at because he had two men that he wanted Joseph to meet. That was going to lead to what we see in a couple of weeks when we come back and we get into chapter 41. And so understand, life is difficult at times. There's no denying that. We all have valleys that we go through. And sometimes, let me just say this to you. We love the mountaintop experiences. But do you ever go to the mountains? And you, you go to the mountains and then it's time to go home. You think, man, I gotta go back home. You spend more time back in the flatlands than you do in the mountains. Now, there are people that live in the mountains. I understand all that. But we can't always live on those mountaintop experiences. Those mountaintop experiences are for the valleys, are preparing us, are powering us up, if you will, filling us up with what we need for the valleys that we're about to go through. And if we remember the God on the mountaintop, the God on the mountaintop is the same God that's in the valley with you. And Joseph finds this out. And so here he is. He's been thrown into prison. And these two men have a dream. It says that the butler and the baker, the king of Egypt, offended their lord, the king of Egypt. What did they do to offend him? I don't know. This, this butler likely would have been the, the, the taste tester. Kings, pharaohs, 
those in authority, generally their meals, someone would test every, taste everything and drink a, a little bit of everything in order to make sure that somebody was not trying to poison the king. So to have that job, was a jo- it was a place of honor, but it was also a place of risk because you're trying it before the king does. And if you remember the story of Nehemiah, who was the king's cupbearer, when he appeared before King Artaxerxes with a sad face, and the king says, why is your countenance? You didn't go before the king with a sad face, because Lamar, he come, he sees you in there with a sad face, he thinks, that, hey, there's a plan afoot, there's something afoot here, there's, there, there's a foul plan at work, and, and he knows about it, and he's, he's nervous about it. Now, you don't want the king thinking that, because what do you say? Uh, take him out and get me another one. You know, it could happen. And so, the taste tester. But they did something that does not tell us what, and it really doesn't matter what they did. All we know is they offended uh, Pharaoh. And it says Pharaoh was, was angry with his two officers, chief butler and the chief baker, so he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. You remember back in the beginning of chapter 39, it says there that Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, same man. Here he is, Potiphar. And so Pharaoh says, put him into prison. And so he puts him in prison where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them. And he served them so they were in custody for a while. So Potiphar brings these two men and he says, here, Pharaoh's not happy with these two. And he sent them down here. But I want you to take care of them while they're here. Because he probably knew that at some point they were going to be restored to their place of service. And he didn't want them being treated too bad. So he says, you watch after them. And you know the story. The but- it says in verse 5, Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream. Both of them, and each man's, uh, uh, excuse me, both of them, each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream with its own interpretation. So here they are, they're in prison. I mentioned this morning about dreams. If you go and just begin to look through the Bible, you'll find a number of people that had dreams. If you go to Genesis chapter 20, you find there were uh, Abraham and Abimelech. Uh, Abraham uh, was there and he had told them that Sarah was his sister. This was the second time he had done this. He told them that Sarah was his sister. Abimelech had taken her. He was going to make her one of his wives. But God appeared to him in a dream. And if you just flip back a couple of pages uh, to Genesis chapter 20, you can see what God says to Abimelech. Because I, because this is, this is it's strong stuff. It says there, uh, I want to begin reading verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech king of Gerar took and took, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken for she is a man's wife. But Elimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Abimelech has this dream. I mean, this was a pretty vivid dream. He says, you are a dead man. You think I get your attention? And you, you read the story, and, and yeah, it raises some questions about the encounter. But you find that uh, Jacob had that dream uh, as he was going to his uncle Laban's and uh, he saw the ladder descending from heaven, the angels uh, coming down and going up. You know, he, he saw that and he knew that he was in the, in the very presence of the Lord. He saw that, excuse me, when he was coming back uh, from his uncle Laban's on his way back to meet Esau. But he saw, he saw this, he had this dream. There are other dreams we, we find in Scripture. And you can make a little bit too much of dreams. I've had people tell me before, well, preacher, I had a dream. God, God told me in a dream. And it always, my ears go up. Because I want to hear if what they tell me that, that God has told them in a dream, if it lines up with the Word of God. 
Because if you have a dream, if you come to me and tell me, preacher, I dreamed something. The Lord told me in a dream, and it goes against the word of God. It didn't come from God. God don't give you a dream that causes you to disobey his word. Now, I won't tell you that God can't speak to you in a dream. I would ask you why, since we have the word of God. There are testimonies from the mission field of people coming to missionaries saying that they had a vision or they had a dream about a man in another village telling about this man named Jesus and they wanted to hear about it. I've heard testimonies from missionaries who have shared that. He, he said there was no gospel witness in the village where this person came from and they just all they knew was they needed to come to the village where I was at and they asked about this man that they had dreamed about and I shared the gospel with them. Can God do that? Absolutely God can do that. But you find if you just go through scripture you'll find a number of dreams. You find that God will speak to pagans in dreams. In Daniel you find Nebuchadnezzar had two dreams. In chapter 2, he had this dream of this uh, uh, figure, the, the figure with the, the, gold, the head of gold, the, the brass, and down the feet. And Daniel interpreted the dream. But what did Daniel tell him? God will give the interpretation of the dream. That's what Joseph does here. And then in chapter 4, he had this, this large tree. And it was just before Nebuchadnezzar was exiled for seven years out into the wilderness to, to eat the grass and his nails grew long and his hair, I mean, he looked like, it said, just like a wild beast, he lived. God can speak through dreams. Joel tells us in Joel that in the latter days, he said, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. God can speak through dreams. But here's the thing. Uh, I mentioned this morning, have you ever had a weird dream? Have you ever, have you ever had a dream that seemed so real that when you woke up, you were glad it was a dream? I mean, you literally were just, I mean, I've dreamed before I was in prison. And it seemed real. And I woke up, and I, and, I mean, I literally still remember and I'm thinking, I had to calm my heart down. You ever had, you know, y'all look at me like a calf at a new gate. Maybe, you know, maybe too much late night pizza. I don't know. But these two men had a dream. And they didn't understand it. And there is Joseph taking care of them. And they both had a dream in the same night. And, they, and each of the dreams had an interpretation. And you know the story. But it says in verse 6, And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house saying, why do you look so sad today? I mean, when I've come in days before, you know, yes, you're in prison. I mean, when you ask somebody in prison, why do you look sad today? Well, let's take a look around. That'd be a good reason, would it not, to be in prison? But apparently, that is, this was not their average looking countenance. It's not the way they normally looked when Joseph came in to check on them. And he asked them, why are you so sad? And so they said to him, we each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. They put a lot of stock in dreams. I mean, you go into the New Testament, you find Joseph. You go into Matthew 1, that uh, the Lord, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, telling him that, what, that Mary was pregnant, it was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And if you, matter of fact, if you go on through uh, Matthew 1 into Matthew 2, you find several occasions a number of occasions, almost five times, where God spoke to Joseph, Mary's husband, not Jesus' father, his stepdad, but spoke to him in a dream. So at first he appeared, it says here in verse 20, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take uh, do you marry your wife? For that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Joseph was aroused from sleep, did as the angel commanded him. You go over in chapter 2, verse 13, that when they fled to Egypt, well, excuse me, you go back up to verse 12, the wise men. How were they warned not to go back to Herod? It says here, then being divinely warned in a, warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Then verse 13, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, 
and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Verse 19, now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. And then you go down to the end of verse 22, And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. So God used dreams to speak, but again, he did this before we had Scripture. Matter of fact, when Joseph was there in prison, there was not one book of the Bible. Genesis is being lived out that Moses would later write. But it's being lived out. And so God spoke through these two, this butler and this baker. And they said, we've had a dream and there's no interpreter. And look what Joseph says. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? That's exactly what Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar later, that the answer comes from the Lord. The answer belongs to God. God has an answer for you. And so he says, tell them to me, please. Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and in the vine there were three branches. It was though it budded, uh, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now within three days Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. I mean, here he is, he tells you, he says, here's what it means. You're about to be out of here. You're about to be set free. You're going to be restored to your former position. Man, that's good news. I don't have to stay in here any longer. And I mean, he didn't know what the dream meant, but Joseph told him, and the, the, the butler believed Joseph's interpretation, but he really believed it when it came to pass, which we'll see in a few moments. But Joseph says to the butler, because Joseph, even though he's not yet heard the baker's dream, he says to the butler, but remember me when it is well with you. And please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews and also I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. That's important that we understand something. Joseph, while he was there, did not just have this laissez-faire attitude that, oh man, it's good, God's in control. Everything's going to work out. He didn't know Romans 8.28. He didn't know what the outcome was going to be. And he's asking the, ba the baker, I mean the butler, he said, look, when, when you are restored to your position, I've told you, your dream, God has said, because he said, do not interpretations belong to the Lord? God has given you an answer. And when God, when he, God restores you, you think it's Pharaoh. I'm telling you Pharaoh's going to restore you, but God is the one doing it. Because he's going to put that butler in position to do something for Joseph. He says, when you come before him, remember me. Remember, and tell Pharaoh, he said, I've done nothing wrong. I, do, I, don't, I shouldn't be here, but I am. And I'm asking, when you're restored, that you remember me. So when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream. And there are three white baskets on my head. And the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. So, you know, here's the, but, the, the baker, and he hears the interpretation that Joseph has given to the butler. He says, man, this guy's got it going on. i got to tell him my dream, because I'm sure that I'm going to get the same thing he's getting. Because I, 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 he had three branches, I had three baskets. You know, and, I mean, that's just what he thought. And Joseph answered verse 18 and said, this is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Imagine the butler said, yeah, I knew it. I knew it. Pharaoh's fixing to restore me too. Have you ever got ahead of God? Have you ever even got over? Me and Steve were talking about this at work the other day, about people getting in over their skis. Have you ever heard that expression? He got, he got out there over his skis. It meant you got, you got out further than you were supposed to be. And it, it, it caused, it look, I, I've never snow skied, but people tell me if you get out over your skis, you're going to take a tumble. 
And usually a tumble and snow skiing are not a good combination. You can get ahead of God. You can run out there and think, oh, the butler's like, yes. Uh, or the baker, rather. I'm, I'm going to be restored. He's, the butler's going to be restored? Three days, three baskets? Ooh. But he goes on, he says, within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Ooh. Time out. Time out. You interpret that one a little too quick. Back up. Joseph, please take a deep breath. Maybe you don't understand what the Lord said. Did, did he, is that in the text? No. But human nature, can you imagine the reaction of the baker? He said, Pharaoh's going to lift your head off. Let me ask something. If you knew you had three days to live, what would you do? Jesus, when he went to Jerusalem, he knew what was about to happen. And he invested that time with his disciples, with, with the apostles, preparing them. But the butler, here he is, knowing. He says, well, excuse me, the baker, I keep saying the butler. The butler's going to be restored, the baker's going to be executed. Thinking, man, why couldn't I have had his dream? Why did the baker have the dream he had? Why did the butler have the dream he had? Because it came from God. I don't know what they did. I don't, but here it is. Verse 29, it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants, then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. That's exactly what Joseph had described. So imagine, Pharaoh's called for them out of the prison. They come up there before Pharaoh. And sure enough, there's the butler, and Pharaoh calls him and the baker in together and has them up there before the people, and the butler he restores to his position. And the baker over there, I know he had to be thinking, uh-uh. And it goes on and it says, But he hanged the chief butler as Joseph had interpreted to them. So there they are. They both were thrown into prison. Why? Because Joseph was there. And Joseph was going to interpret their dreams based upon the interpretation that God gave him. God had put him there. That's something else I want you to remember is that whenever you're in a dark place, whenever you're in a place you don't want to be, you can still serve God right there. I have heard testimonies of people that were on a chemo ward receiving chemotherapy and would go and visit with the other patients and have prayer and seek to bring encouragement to them. No matter where you're at, no matter what your circumstances, don't tell me you can't serve God. Because you can. The question is not as if you can serve God. The question is, will you serve God? And Joseph did. And he interpreted the, their dreams. And what was Joseph's reward for this? Verse 23 says, Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Now when this story begins in chapter 40 here, Joseph is now 28 years old. And we know that because later in chapter 41, it tells us here in, in uh, 41 verse 1, it came to pass at the end of two full years. So we know there's two, two years that have gone by. And then you look at verse 46 uh, of chapter 41. It says, Joseph was 30 years, years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That's, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But I want you to understand something. When these two men, Joseph's in the prison, how, lo how long had he served in Potiphar's house? I don't know. How long had he already been in the prison? I don't know. But I do know that he was 28 years old. He had been there. He, his brother sold him when he was 18. So 10 years have gone by. Excuse me, 17. 10 years, uh, 11 years have gone by. I went to school in Tifton, so I had to watch my math. 11 years. You think, 
how long can I, how long, Lord, how long can I stay in this place? As long as God wishes you to remain there and you accomplish what God wants you to do while you're there. Has anybody ever told you that you can serve God right where you're at? I can tell you this. You cannot serve God where you're not. But you can serve him where you're at. Circumstances may not be the best, may not be what you like, but you can serve him. Joseph did that, and God is preparing him for what we're going to see in a couple of weeks in chapter 41 is Pharaoh's dream. God gives Pharaoh two dreams. The, the butler and the baker just have one apiece. Pharaoh has two dreams. I mentioned about a dream waking you up. Pharaoh's dream woke him up. Pharaoh's dream disturbed him. And Joseph was in a place, even though it says here that the chief butler did not remember Joseph but forgot him, and then verse 41, or verse 1 of first, uh, chapter 41, then it came to pass, there's that phrase again, it came to pass, not to stay. All I want to tell you is be encouraged to serve God right where you're at because the devil will tell you, man, your circumstances are too tough. They're too much. God, you, you've done, God don't want nothing to do with you. Don't you buy that line. Don't you believe that lie? You can serve God right where you are. The question is, will you? Joseph did. Was Joseph any different than you and I? Nope. The difference, I would say that no and yes. No, he had emotions, feelings, all this just like you and I. We see that when he asked the baker, or when he, or excuse me, the butler, he said, when you get out of this place, when Pharaoh restores you, remember me. We see that emotion in Joseph. He had that. And yet, he was faithful to the Lord. Serve him now, right where you're at, and see where God will take you. Because I want to ask you this question, I close. Why should God take you somewhere better if you're not serving him where you're at? You've got to be faithful where you're at and see where God will take you on the journey and trust him in the process. Would you stand and we're going to pray? And with that, we're all home, folks. We're going to be dismissed with a word of prayer. Uh, Blaine, would you dismiss us with a word of prayer, please, sir?